speak here today. Um, you don't, I know no introduction then, as Tara has just introduced me. That's my Twitter handle if you wish to follow me um, there. So what I'm going to do today in the next hour, I suppose, is give you an introduction or an overview of a flow cytometry. In, in many respects, it won't be um, a very deep dive into cytometry. Maybe we could arrange some future webinars on that. But I want to give you the overarching principles of how flow cytometry works. And I, what I will do at the end is just give you a couple of examples of applications as well. So let's start by thinking about what the definition of flow cytometry is, or cytometry. And cytometry really just comes from two Greek roots, the cyto, ketos, meaning cell, and the metry, making measurements. And we make measurements all the time in the lab, don't we? If we look down a microscope, we're looking at the size and the shape of cells and so on. And a flow cytometer could be really considered to be a big microscope. And this is my definition of, of flow cytometry. It's not particularly elegant, too many words there, but it does contain all the information you need to know. Flow cytometry is very rapid compared to microscopy. We can look at several thousand cells per second, five or 10,000 cells per second, much quicker than looking down a microscope. Actually, I don't use the word cells here, I use particles because we don't have to use whole cells. We can use parts of cells, extracellular vesicles, for example, exosomes, isolated chromosomes, anything that will give us physical and chemical measurements. By physical measurements, I mean that the way particles interact with light, as they might do on a light microscope. And by chemical measurements, I mean by looking at fluorescence labelling, which is what we might do on a fluorescence microscope. Of course, we're not using a slide, as the definition of flow cytometry seems to implicate we're using this to look at cells in suspension and they flow past the sensing point. And importantly, they flow one by one. So we're making single cell or single particle measurements. And that's a huge benefit of flow cytometry, one of the original single cell technologies. So flow cytometers come in two different flavors, if you like, analyzers and sorters. Analyzers where we can get information about our cells but ultimately they, we don't retrieve them. But cell sorters actually allow us to do just that, to retrieve a population of cells of interest so that we can take them away for further study. It might be simply regrowing them. It might be transplanting them. It may be extracting DNA or RNA or protein. The principles of the way these two work, though, are very, very similar. So how, how does a flow cytometer work? I've already mentioned that it's a little bit like a fluorescence microscope. And I'm sure we're all aware how fluorescence microscopes work. We take a light source, we shine it on our cells that are stuck to a slide or a Petri dish or a substrate. And if those cells have been labeled with some fluorescent markers, we generate fluorescence, we generate photons. We pass those photons through an optical filter and we make an observation. So if we're looking at GFP cells, for example, we can see how many there are. But we can also say, oh, look, there's a very bright GFP cell, there's a dim cell, and there's a moderate GFP cell. Now, flow cytometer, in essence, is, is not much different. We take a light source, generally a laser. We have our cells in suspension. But if they've been labeled with any fluorochromes, the process, the physical process is the same. We get the generation of photons. We pass those photons through an optical filter. But now, like in many areas of life, we've been replaced by an electronic system. And that electronic system captures that light and importantly, quantitates it, turns it into a measurable signal. So now we can give a value to that bright, that moderate and that dim GFP cell. Actually, flow cytometers are more versatile than that because we can use a single laser to excite more than one fluorochrome. And for each of those fluorochromes that's attached to a different part of the cell, we can capture and quantitate the light. It gets even better because most of our flow cytometers have multiple lasers. The more lasers we have, the more fluorochromes we can excite. The more fluorochromes we can excite, the more things we can measure, the more characteristics of our cells we can measure, which makes flow cytometry a fantastic technique for dissecting heterogeneous populations, things like peripheral blood, 
Many of you will be familiar with what flow cytometry data actually looks like. I'm not going to talk too much about data analysis today, just to show you that um, one thing we always have to do <clears throat> is reduce the data file to the things that we're interested in by using what we call regions and, and gates. And once we've done that, we can display our data generally in two different ways, either as a single parameter histogram, where we're looking at increasing fluorescence intensity against cell count, or by a bivariate plot where we're looking at the expression of one marker against another one, CD3 and CD4 in this case. So we're very visual creatures as humans, and I can see here that I've got a negative population and a positive population. I can see in this bivariate, bivariate plot that I have a double negative, double positive, and then two single positive populations. And flow cytometry is great because it gives us that visualization. And that's, look, that is great in lab meetings and presentations. But what we also get is a number. We can look at the percentage of cells that are expressing the markers. We can look at the level that they're expressing them. And it's those numbers that are actually going to get your paper published. So I'm sure some of you are familiar with flow cytometry and flow cytometers, and you may be familiar with some of these. This is just a few examples of the cytometers that are out there on the market. Now, you're probably aware that Beckman Coulter and Beckton Dickinson are the two big players in the market, and they both have a range of cytometers from relatively simple things like the Fax Calibre and the Cyan to the top of the range Cytoflex and Symphony machines. But you can also see from the bottom row here that there are other manufacturers that also make flow cytometers. Now, they're different sizes and shapes and colors and costs, but basically they all work in its in the same way which is why whenever i'm training somebody we can be relatively agnostic to the type of cytometer that you are using because the principles are the same whichever one you use and all flow cytometers will have four basic components we have a fluidics component that's what makes the flow cytometer a flow cytometer and that fluid in your cytometer is there to do two things it's to take the cells through the machine and also to make sure that as far as possible, we make single cell measurements. Remember, that's one of the biggest plus points of a flow cytometer. We have an optical system, which is going to consist of a laser or lasers and optical filters that allow us to select wavelengths of light that we're interested in. We have a detection system. So these are our eyes that are going to capture that light, turn it into a measurable signal. And then we're going to have some form of computer that allows us to do our data analysis. So the advantages of flow cytometry is that we can measure very many events very quickly, which makes it very useful if you're looking for rare events. The data file sizes means that the statistical information that we derive is very robust. And we can be very flexible in the way we design experiments. As I said, if we have, there are some cytometers out there that may have five or six lasers and are capable of measuring 20 or 30 different fluorochromes. Very often we're not doing experiments that are that complicated. So we have some flexibility in the way we can design our experiments. As I said, flow cytometry is a fluorescence based technology. And I always start off by talking about fluorescence because in, in truth, the cytometers themselves haven't changed that much in the last 30 or 40 years. They may have become more efficient and more expensive, but the basic principles are, are the same. What has changed in flow cytometry are the number and type of fluorochromes that we use. So understanding something about that is going to be inherent to your experiment because the two weapons we have, if you like, in our experiments are the reagents, the fluorochromes, and the cytometer that we're going to run that experiment on. And I'm sure many of you are aware the basic principles of fluorescence is we're going to shine light at one wavelength onto a molecule, and it's going to emit light at a different wavelength, a different color. And it's that color change, that color shift that we're detecting in fluorescence microscopy or flow cytometry. And fluorescence comes in two parts. Intrinsic fluorescence, which we may more commonly call autofluorescence. Now, all cells are autofluorescent. We are all autofluorescent. You, know, you shine the right color light on us, and we'll glow. And that autofluorescence comes from certain parts of the cells. Many amino acids are fluorescent. NADH, flavins, melanin, chlorophyll. These are all fluorescent molecules. So we talk a lot in flow cytometry about signal to noise ratio. 
the noise in our system is very often due to the autofluorescence. So that's a good thing and potentially a bad thing. It's a good thing because it gives us that background level so we can compare our signal to, but it can be a bad thing if that autofluorescence level is high. So understanding something about your cells is crucial to an experiment because most of the time what we're doing is we're adding fluorescence, whether that's a fluorochrome labeled antibody, an engineered fluorescent protein, or some other fluorescent probe. Fluorescence is dealing with the visible light spectrum. Now, whichever mnemonic you learnt at school for the colours of the rainbow, that's actually quite useful in flow cytometry. But of course, we should be more scientific than that, shouldn't we? So here at the high energy, the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, this is around about 350 nanometers wavelength light. And then as we pass through the colours, you know, violet, blue, green, yellow, orange, red, come to infrared, this is around about 850 nanometers. So actually we've got quite a narrow range in the electromagnetic spectrum to deal with when we're talking about fluorescence. And importantly, we should always be also thinking that we're, we're going to be moving from high energy towards low energy. I said we get a color shift. It's always going to be going towards the red end of the spectrum, or towards the lower end of the spectrum. Why? Well, we think about what happens at the molecular level in a fluorochrome. This is a very dumbed down um, cartoon. A particle physicist would probably laugh at this, but uh, it works for us. Many molecules will have an unpaired electron in their outer orbit. And if it's unpaired, it's a little bit unstable. And if I hit it with some energy, and in this case, I've used the photon. If I'm lucky, that electron is excited to the next level. It's now very unstable. It's both rotating, vibrating. It wants to collapse the ground state where it's more stable. And after a certain period of time, that's what it does. And when it collapses the ground state, it releases energy. But because that process of the electron being excited and collapsing has absorbed some energy, what happens is the photon that's emitted has a lower energy, therefore a longer wavelength. So we're always thinking about moving from the ultraviolet towards the infrared when we talk about fluorescence. And importantly, this happens very quickly in the realm of nanoseconds. That's actually important for us in flow cytometry because in order to measure 10,000 cells per second, we have to illuminate them for a very short period of time. But even so, that short period of time is around about two microseconds. So it's a thousand times longer than this time frame. So as soon as that electron is back to ground state, it can be excited again. So our fluorochromes can be excited multiple times as they pass through the laser beam. I say laser beams, what are we using to excite our fluorochromes? Well, Going back to the early days of flow cytometry, we had what are often we will refer to as a blue laser, but we should be more specific, 488 nanometer lasers. And that was great because it allows us to excite a couple of the very common fluorochromes we used at the time, fluorescein for proteins, propidium iodide for, iodide for DNA analysis. Now, if I've got a blue laser, I've got this much space in the electromagnetic spectrum to detect emitted light. 40 years ago, though, we added more lasers to our cytometer. We started by adding a red laser around about 640 nanometers. Gave us some different fluorochromes we could excite, but actually a smaller space in the spectrum to detect the emitted fluorescence. 30 years ago, we added violet lasers, 405 nanometers, and now we'll find green or yellow green or even ultraviolet lasers on our flow cytometers. This actually has a practical implication because if you have a UV laser, you have the whole of the electromagnetic spectrum to detect emitted fluorescence. So you're likely to be able to measure six or eight or 10 different fluorochromes. Whereas if you have a red laser, because there's less space here, you might only be able to measure three or four fluorochromes. Now all fluorochromes have a couple of properties that we need to be aware of. They have an excitation and an emission spectrum. And Again, if you're used to cytometry, you may have seen some of these, but if you're not, this is a good place to start because most of the manufacturers of reagents and cytometers will have these online. This is the excitation and emission spectrum of fluorescein, a very common dye that we use to bind to proteins, to antibodies for antibody labeling. 
The dotted line here is its excitation spectrum. The filled line is its emission spectrum. The important word is spectrum. As you can see, fluorescein is, because this is a, a normalized curve, it's optimally excited at about 495 nanometers. But in our cytometer, we have a blue laser, 488 nanometers. So that's the one that we're going to use to optimally excite fluorescein. But we need to be aware, if I have a UV laser, that will also excite fluorescein, not as efficiently, but nonetheless, it will excite it. But if I can, I'm going to use my blue laser to excite fluorescein. And of course, when we excite fluorescein, remember it emits photons, and those photons are going to be at a longer wavelength. But fluorescein doesn't always emit a photon at exactly the same wavelength. There's a range, a spectrum again. And this filled line or filled curve here is a probability curve. What that means is most of the time, fluorescein will emit light at around about 530 nanometers. But occasionally, it'll emit light at 500 nanometers. Even more occasionally, it might emit light at 700 nanometers. And the thing is, if I take a single molecule of fluorescein, I don't actually know which wavelength of photon will come out. But that's not what we do in our experiments. We take an antibody and we maybe add six or eight fluorescein molecules to it. We take our cell and we may have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of antigenic sites. And remember, we're exciting our fluorochromes multiple times when we pass them through the laser beam. So what that means is that every time we run an experiment with fluorescein, this emission spectrum will look like this. And we can be confident that it will always look like that. If I wanted to multiplex, remember that's one of the important uh, plus points of a flow cytometer. What I need to do is I need to find another fluorochrome that I can use that's excited by the same laser, but that emits at a different color. So let's look at another molecule, PE, phycoerythrin. Another molecule you might be familiar with that we use in antibody staining. It's also reasonably well excited at 488, actually better excited at 560 nanometers, but for years we used the blue laser because that's all we had. But you can see from its emission spectrum that it's no longer green, it's sort of in the orange region of the spectrum. So if I overlay those two plots, what we can see is that we can use the same laser to excite both of those fluorochromes and their emission spectra not completely separate, but separate enough for us to start making individual measurements from fluorescein stained cells and PE stained cells. But I can't look at the entire emission spectrum. And this is no different to a microscope. What we do is we filter the light. We have an optical filter in our cytometer just to allow wavelengths of light through that are mostly specific for fluorescein and mostly specific for PE. It's not 100% perfect, as I'll come back to a little bit later on. So we use optical filters in our flow cytometers in the same way we use them in a microscope. And there are three types of optical filter you're likely to come across. What we call long pass dichroic filters, short pass dichroic filters, and band pass filters. And these all have specific definitions. So a long pass filter will allow light above a specific wavelength to pass through. So in this example, long pass 500, all the light above 500 nanometers will pass through. And in the case of a dichroic long pass filter, the light below 500 nanometers will be reflected in a specific direction rather than randomly. So we can use these filters to separate bands of light, everything above 500 from everything below 500. We can do this the other way around by using a short pass filter. And as the name suggests, all light below a particular wavelength will pass through. So the short pass 500, all the light below 500 passes through, is transmitted, whereas the light above 500 is reflected in a specific direction. And we're going to use these long and short pass filters in our cytometer to steer photons through the machine. But to make the fluorescence that we detect specific for the fluorochromes we're using, we will also use band pass filters. And these are a sort of a sandwich, if you like, of a long pass and a short pass filter. And they allow a band of light to pass through. So the nomenclature here, I hope you can read this, BP500 slash 50. At 50, that second number, is the width of the band. So this tells me that this filter allows 50 nanometers worth of light to pass through. And the 500 means that it's centered at 500 nanometers. 
So the transmission is not 500 plus or minus 50, it's 500 plus or minus 25. The whole width is 50 nanometers. The center is 500. So this is not unique to flow cytometry, any fluorescence-based technology, so microscopy or confocal microscopy. We need to know something about our fluorochromes because we need to know the excitation spectrum because this tells us, can I actually excite this fluorochrome on the cytometer that I have or how efficiently can I excite it? And the emission spectrum that gives us an idea of which optical filter we would use to capture the maximum emission of that light. But we also need to know something else about our fluorochromes as well. We need to understand a little bit about the chemistry of them, because this is going to help us in designing our experiments. And not all fluorochromes are equal. Obviously, they all have different excitation and emission spectra, but they also have different chemistry. So some of the dyes that we use are small cyclic rings. So I've already mentioned fluorescein or FITC. You can see it's a small molecule. Now, when I've got a small molecule like that, that tells me several things. It tells me if I want to bind that to an antibody, which is big, I can probably put several of those small fluorochromes onto it. The more fluorochromes I put on, the brighter it becomes. It helps with my signal to noise ratio. It also means that if I'm looking for something inside the cell, in the cytoplasm of the nucleus, I maybe don't have to fight quite as hard if I'm only adding a small amount of um, molecular weight to my antibody. And if I have a small molecule like this, I think it's more likely to be resistant to things like fixation and permeabilization, or the things that we're going to do to our cells to actually do the staining. The Alexa dyes, some of you will be familiar with those. They're, they were designed to be an analog of, of fluorescein. They're, they're um, very useful. One way they are very useful is fluorescein is actually quite pH dependent, um, whereas Alexa, the Alexa dyes are, are not. Um, the cyanin dyes are also small cyclic ring dyes, and I'll come back to those in, in a second. And many of the dyes that we use to bind to DNA are small because they have to intercalate into quite a small space in the helix. Not all of the dyes that we use, though, have the fluorochromes that we use are small. So I mentioned PE already. PE is a large protein. So is APC, alophycocyanin. Per, per CP is another large protein. And, and these are slightly different because if I shine light at fluorescein, that whole molecule becomes active and it emits light. Whereas if I shine light at PE, it's not the whole molecule, the whole protein that becomes fluorescent, just small pockets sort of indicated by those arrows there and that that's that's important to us but if i look at pe so pe is a big molecule if i bind that to an antibody i can really only bind it in a one-to-one -one ratio and it makes that antibody complex now almost twice as big so although i wouldn't say don't use pe for intracellular staining we have to we're going to have to fight harder to get it into the cell so knowing something about the size will help us also, because it's a protein, it's more likely to be affected by fixation and permeabilization. So this is something we would have to check in our experiment. Does that matter to us if we lose some fluorescence? Maybe, maybe not. But the fact that it's not the whole PE molecule that becomes fluorescent, just these small pockets, was very useful to us in the early days of flow cytometry when we developed what we call tandem dyes. And what we did in the development of these tandem dyes was take one of these small cyanin dyes and chemically couple it to each of the fluorescent parts of PE or APC or per CP. And we created a whole series of tandem dyes. So with these, what happens if you excite PSI5, for example, with blue light, the PE, rather than becoming fluorescent itself, it transfers its energy to the cyanin dye, which is then the dye that emits so if I look at these two dyes, P size 7 and APC size 7, they're both going to emit light at the same wavelength. It's the size 7 part of the dye that emits light. But actually we can use these together because we can excite P size 7 with a blue laser and APC size 7 with a red laser. So although they're emitting light at the same part of the spectrum, because we're using different lasers to excite them, we can separate the fluorescence. So these tandem dyes were... I said very useful to us in the early days, but they do come with a, a little caveat that we have to think about in that 
what I've shown you here is the emission spectrum P size 7. Here's the size 7 part of the dye, but we always get a little bit of residual fluorescence here from the donor, the protein part of the dye, PE in this case. And that's something we have to be aware of. So tandem dyes are great because they give us more versatility, but we have to be aware of this. The way dyes are stored and the way uh, we prepare our samples is more crucial with the tandem dyes. There are other types of dye as well that we, uh, that we use, um, things like nanocrystals or Q dots or quantum dots, which are small inorganic molecules. We can change the color of the fluorescence by changing the size of them. Um, these were very useful in the early 90s when they had a little bit out of favor, but have now been revived by the Starbright series of dyes from Biorad. We have these polymer dyes. Some of you might be familiar with the brilliant violet dyes whole string of cyclic rings, which are good at absorbing light, but rather than emitting light, they transfer their energy to a fluorochrome in the middle. So getting a lot of energy going in, hopefully a lot of light coming out. So there's a whole series of brilliant dyes. There's a whole series of similar dyes from Thermo Fisher called super bright dyes. There's also these dyes called Novaflor dyes, which are actually small fragments of DNA into which we've impregnated fluorescence. So there are new dyes coming on stream all the time, which is why I mentioned at the beginning that actually it's, it's important for us to understand something about the characteristics of these dyes. The other thing we want to know about a, a dye for flow cytometry is how bright it is, because that helps with our signal to noise ratio. And we can determine that quite easily by doing a very simple experiment. So here I've taken CD4 labeled with FITC, CD4 labeled with PE. And we can see in these two histograms that I've got the same sort of expression, haven't I? I've got a positive and a negative peak, a positive and a negative peak. But in the PE, there's a bigger distance between those two peaks than there is in FITC. So this tells me that PE is a brighter, relatively brighter dye than FITC. We can actually derive a number for this as well called a stain index, which I won't go into here. But what it means is that we can rank our fluorochromes according to brightness. Generally, we do this relatively quantitatively, so saying that they're very bright down to they're dim. And this is another important consideration we're going to think about when we're designing an experiment, because if I've got a weakly expressed marker, I probably want to use one of these very bright dyes. Doesn't mean to say these dim dyes aren't useful, because sometimes my antigen or my marker is highly expressed. I don't necessarily need to use a bright dye to see it. So you know, we've spent a little bit of time now talking about fluorescence and how it's achieved, but all of this is going to help you with your panel design and the way you actually prepare your samples. But of course, what we want to know, of course, so the other thing is how does a flow cytometer actually work? We've got these fluorochromes on our cells. How do we get, make measurements? Well, as we've seen, just to, to recap the slide I showed you earlier, all flow cytometers have the same four components, the fluidics, the optics, the detectors in some way, of displaying the data. So all flow cytometers have sheath fluid. And that sheath fluid is normally a form of PBS, doesn't have to be. Some cytometers actually recommend you use water as a sheath fluid. And we can do that because the sheath fluid is there to carry your cells in their own sample fluid through the cytometer. They don't actually mix, or at least they don't mix until they end up in a waste container. But they also have the, this fluid has the advantage that it helps us make single cell measurements, which I'll come to in the next slide. Um, so constantly flowing through our cytometer, which is pressurized, we have a column of sheath fluid. And into that column of sheath fluid, we're going to inject our samples. And different cytometers have different ways of doing that. Many of the BD machines use a pressurized tube to do it. Things like the Cytoflex and the um, ZE5 use a, a peristaltic pump. Milteni machines use a syringe injection. It doesn't matter which way it's done. In fact, you can't change that. That's inherent to your cytometer. But those, different, those are different ways of actually getting your cells into that column of sheath fluid. And within our cytometer, we're going to use two fluidics principles to help us make single cell measurements. First of these is what we call laminar flow. I mentioned flow cytometers are pressurized and they're pressurized to a particular pressure at which when we inject our cells, which is the sort of pink thing in the middle there, we inject our cells into our column of sheath fluid, those two columns of fluid will be traveling at the same speed. They're separate, but they're traveling at the same speed. 
But in order to make single cell measurements, we use a process called hydrodynamic focusing. And what we do here is we place a constriction to our column. Now, if I've got fluid going at a given pressure, if it's got less space, it has to speed up. And if we make that constriction at the point where our cells are being injected, what that does is it has two effects. It starts pinching off our cells one by one. It starts separating them. And it means that we're focusing them. They're all flowing through the middle of that column of sheath fluid. So that means they should all go through approximately the same point of our laser beams. And this is all to reduce variability. And if we take a cross section here, what we would see is our sheath fluid surrounding our sample in the middle. So you can sort of just see, uh, see that in the middle here, this sort of conical structure is this constriction. You can see a metal um, sample injection lever here where the cells are popping out. And here is where they're going to go through multiple laser beams, one or more laser beams. And at that point, of course, afflorescence is generated. But so by the time they get to this point, the flow cell, the cells are flowing one by one. So that's helped us make our single cell measurements. And as each cell goes through the laser beam, what happens? Well, we generate photons. So we've already seen with fluorochromes, we're going to get photons that are a different wavelength to the laser. One of the definitions of fluorescence, we're looking for that change in wavelength. But we also get photons from the way our cells or our particles interact with the laser. They scatter that light as well. So in all our flow cytometers, we measure not just fluorescence, but also light scatter. Now, as a cell goes through the laser beam, fluorescence is emitted and light is scattered in all directions. But in most of our flow cytometers, we don't collect all of that light. We just use two collection lenses, one that's set in front of the laser beam, 180 degrees to the laser beam, where actually we only collect what we call forward scattered light or forward scatter. We have another lens that's set at 90 degrees to that interrogation point where we're going to collect both scatter and fluorescence. So we collect light scatter in two different directions, 180 degrees and 90 degrees, forward scatter and side scatter or 90 degree light scatter. And we use that light scatter signal to help us actually tell the cytometer you know, something's happening. Let's, let's make a measurement. So if I've got no cell in my flow cell, my laser just passes straight through. It's a bit of metal, it's reflected away. When a cell enters that laser beam, now it's interacting with your laser. It's refracting and diffracting and reflecting that light. So some of those photons from the laser beam are going to be diverted away from that obscuration bar and into the detector. Now, often you'll hear people talk about forward scatter being related to cell size. Side scatter is sending cell granularity, neither of which is true, right? We're actually making a complex optical measurement here. And the signal that we get is influenced by multiple things. Yes, size is one of them, because if I've got a bigger cell, there's more of it to interact with light than if I've got a small cell. But actually the biggest influence on light scatter is the refractive index difference between the inside and the outside of the cell. The bigger that is, the more light is scattered. It also depends on the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio. The nucleus is very dense, so it scatters more light. So if I've got a big nucleus, it's going to scatter more light than a small nucleus. It does depend on granularity, but it depends on the number and the type of granules. And it also depends on the shape of the cell. So a smooth cell is not going to scatter as much light as a ruffled cell, which is why we get a different signal from a live compared to a dead cell. If it's a dead cell, it starts to become a bit blebby. In some situations, we can use light scatter to help us get some important information. So this is a, a plot of peripheral blood, forward scatter, side scatter. And in a good preparation, we can sort of see where our lymphocytes, monocytes and granulocytes fall. But actually, we know that each of those cell types expresses specific markers. So I wouldn't always use light scatter as the, uh, the final decision maker. But it, help, it does help us make some decisions. So as I said, we get fluorescence emitted in all directions as well, but we only collect that at 90 degrees. And this is where we're going to use those filters, those long pass, short pass and band pass filters to help us separate light into the wavelengths that we're interested in.
And different cytometers do this in, in different ways, but the principle is the same. They're going to use generally a combination of long or short pass filters to steer the light and then band pass filters in front of a detector to make that detection specific for that particular fluorochrome. So this may look like a horrendous diagram if you've not seen something like this before, um, but hopefully we can see the logic of it. So in this particular experiment, we want to measure these four things, light scatter, forward scatter and side scatter, and fluorescence for two different dyes, FITC and PER-CP. So here's our cell, goes through the laser beam. Remember in front of that laser beam, we're going to measure forward light scatter. Not interested in fluorescence, just light scatter. So in front of that detector, we're going to have a, a narrow band pass filter centered at the wavelength of the laser. So that's just going to allow laser scatter to go through, not fluorescence. The light at 90 degrees, it's a lens, a collimating lens. And then in this particular example, it hits a filter and that's a 500 long pass dichroic filter. If you remember from the definition that the long pass filter, all light above 500 passes through, all light below 500 is going to be reflected in a specific direction, in this case, 90 degrees. So this is going to be where our light scatter is going to be, right? below 500 nanometers. So again, we're going to put a narrow band pass filter in front of our detector that allows us to detect our side scatter. The light that comes through this mirror then hits another one, 560 long pass now. So all the light above 560 goes this way, all the light below 560 goes this way. And in both cases, we're putting a filter, a band pass filter in front of that detector that is allows us to capture the um, emission peak of each of those fluorochromes. And this arrangement will be common to every, almost every cytometer out there. You will occasionally hear people talk about their fluorescence one, fluorescence two detectors. Don't do that. It's not best practice. We should either talk about the fluorescein detector or more uh, specifically talk about the filter that has the 53030 band pass filter, because we wouldn't always use that to measure fluorescein. It might be Alex 488, it might be GFP, it might be CFSE. They're all emitting at the same point. We would use the same filter. So we split the light up, hopefully logically. We now have to capture that light, detect it. And there are several different types of detector that you'll find in flow cytometers. By far the most common, certainly to recently, up until recently, were photomultiplier tubes, PMTs. But more recently, we've seen avalanche photodiodes or silicon photodiodes in, in added into our flow cytometers. Again, this is not something you can change. It'll be something that's inherent to your flow cytometer. And in fact, they all do the same thing. They all convert light energy into an electrical signal, same as our retinal cells. Um, I put the example of the PMT here, the photomultiplier tube, because it's the most common still. Um, and out at the end of our PMT, this is where we're going to capture our light and turn it into a signal. We're getting a signal coming out of our PMT. Now, the signal that comes out is dependent on two things, the number of photons that go in, but also the M part of PMT, the multiplication factor. By applying a voltage across that PMT, we can increase or decrease the signal. So that means that setting of that voltage can be extremely important. And it means that controls are also extremely important, as they are, of course, in any experiment that we run. But for every fluorochrome that we measure on our flow cytometer, we get this pulse of light. And we can measure three things about the, that pulse of light. We can measure the height of it, which gives us the point at which we're getting the most photons out of our cell. We can measure the width, which gives us an idea of how long that cell is part, taken to pass through the laser beam, or we can measure the area under that curve. And that gives us the best measure of total fluorescence. So that's the one that normally is, is used as a default. So if you've used a flow cytometer, you might be familiar with, with it saying forward scatter A. That's what that A is, it's the area of that pulse. And flow cytometers are very sensitive machines. Right? They'll, they'll measure whatever is in your tube. And of course, often you don't want to measure everything that's in your tube you might have a lot of debris so a procession of events like this you know two small bits of debris then a cell and some more bits of debris of different sizes then a cell and so on to the cytometer this just looks like a series of pulses small ones for the debris big ones for the cell 
So often we, we don't care about that debris. So what we do is we apply what we call a threshold. Okay? And the threshold is an electronic hurdle above which something has to jump before we measure it. Now, this is something that we can change. So there's a bit of responsibility there. Here's our peripheral blood um, plot again. And you can see just about maybe that there's no data here. There's no data there because we've said to the cytometer, unless something has a forward scatter signal above 50, I want you to ignore it. Now, I may do this experiment day in, day out. I know that this blue population here is debris. So what I can do is I can increase the threshold. Now, there's more space here where there's no data. But I have to be careful because if I increase it too much, then I start losing information from my cells. So, you know, I said this is something you can change, but you do have to be a little bit wary. Actually, I would probably go somewhere in between these. I do like to see a little bit of debris because I know then I know I'm not missing any cells. But obviously, I don't want too much because I'm not going. I'm not interested in it anyway. It's just clogging up my data file. So, what have we done so far? Is we've taken the cell, we've added some fluorescence to it. We've run it through our flow cytometer and we've got that pulse of light and we've made some measurements on those pulses of light. And basically we've taken all that biology and we've turned it into a spreadsheet. And we're going to use that spreadsheet to actually de develop or, or, or uh, plot the histograms and the bivariate plots that I showed you earlier. So our data in flow cytometry is really a spreadsheet, right? A cell one goes through the laser beam, we're going to get a value for each parameter that we've measured, in this case, forward and side scattering, two different fluorochromes. Second cell goes through, I get a different set of values. Third cell goes through, another set, and so on. This is the single cell nature of flow cytometry. So I could use Excel to analyze my data. So if I wanted to produce a histogram for this particular column, I just say to the software, you know, isolate that column and start plotting those values according to their intensity. And then we build up our histogram. If I want to compare two different fluorochromes. Again, I look at those two columns and I plot each cell according to its value and each axis, and we build up our dot plots. I wouldn't suggest doing it in Excel because there are better ways of, of doing it, but you know the principle is exactly the same. So why do you need to know all of this? Because as usual with any experiment or any type of equipment in the lab, the more you understand about it, the better you're going to be able to design an experiment and the better you're going to be able to troubleshoot things when things go wrong. Of course, it also helps you think about um, which machine that you're using. As I said, you've got your two weapons, your fluorochromes and your cytometer. The fluorochromes we can change. Often the cytometer, you can't. You may only have one particular cytometer in your lab, your institute, your company. So you have to know what's in it, you know, which lasers you have, how many fluorochromes you can detect, and which filters are there. All of these things will help you design an experiment. An experimental design is actually you know, quite quite complex. We, we could actually run several webinars on experimental design. What I did want to very briefly mention um, was the, uh, the importance and the concept of fluorescence compensation. Okay, again, this is I could spend a whole hour on compensation, which I'm not going to. I'm going to do it in two slides. And the reason we need compensation, again, in any fluorescence experiment, this is no different to microscopy, is because of the spectrum that we get of our emission. So that overlay I showed you earlier of FITC and PE, if you look closely, you can see that some of those photons from FITC will end up going into the PE detector. We know this. It's the physics of fluorescence. Some of those photons from PE will be in the orange region of the spectrum. Sorry, from FITC will be in the orange region of the spectrum. Similarly, a few photons from PE may end up in the FITC detection channel. Now, of course, this is something we know, and it's something that we have to deal with. We deal with it by this process of fluorescence compensation. So if I take a very simple experiment where I've taken negative beads and FITC positive beads, if I look at the FITC histogram, I see negative and positive. That's exactly what I expect, right? But if I look at the PE channel, I also see negative and positive. Now, there's no PE in this experiment, so it can't be from PE. But of course, what it is are these photons from FITC that are being emitted in that region of the spectrum. The cytometer doesn't know where they're coming from. It's just diverting them according to their wavelength. So this is what I have to account for by this process of compensation. And actually, it's relatively 
simple. We just look at the ratio of the number of photons that are ending up in the FITC channel to the number of photons that are in the PE channel, because that ratio will remain constant at a given voltage. And then we can do a mathematical transformation of the data. At the end of compensation, we still see negative and positive in our FITC channel, but now we just see a single population in the PE channel. And we know this is correctly compensated because we can look at the fluorescence intensity of this negative and FITC positive population and show that they're the same in the PE channel, which is what we want at the end of compensation. And there are a couple of rules of compensation that you need to think about before you come to the cytometer. So the important thing is to set compensation, you need a single color control. That is something that's only been stained with one fluorochrome. Because we're going to run it and we're going to look and see where the photons from that fluorochrome end up. And if it ends up in channels that we don't want, that's where we perform our transformation, our compensation. So our single color controls should fulfill these three rules. That we're going to use the same fluorochrome in our control as our sample. So if I've got FITC in my sample, I have to use FITC in my controls, not Alexa 488, because they're different fluorochromes. And I need to treat the samples in the same way. Remember, some of our fluorochromes are susceptible to fixation and permeabilization. So if our samples are fixed and permeabilized, our controls need to be fixed and permeabilized. Secondly, that in our control, our positive part of the control should be at least as bright as anything we're going to find in our samples. Because the further our negative and our positive are apart, the better the maths. And we also need to match the autofluorescence of the carrier. And that carrier can be, can be beads or it can be cells. So what we have to remember is we're using beads. We use the positive bead and look at the negative, the autofluorescence of the negative bead. If we're using cells, we use the positive and negative cells. We can do this compensation live or we can do it offline. We can be manual or it can be automatic. Automatic. Normally we show people manual compensation, but then recommend you never do that. Use the automatic compensation that you have on your program. So in the, in the last few minutes, I just wanted to give some examples of the uses of flow cytometry. There are actually hundreds of applications of flow cytometry. Anything that you can think that you can label in your cell with a fluorochrome, you can use flow cytometry for. So it can be something like cell state, you know, what's on a cell or in a cell. So immunophenotyping is by far the most common application, I suppose, of flow cytometry. But we can look at you know, the DNA content of cells. We can look at cell proliferation. We can look at the, uh, the, the, the state of the cell, if you like, the ac activation, look at signaling pathways. But we can also look at cell function. In fact, cell state, I think, is, you know, it's, it's quite easy. It's, it's like looking at a collection of people and you know, identifying them by their characteristics, their glasses, the color of their hair, and so on. If you want to actually find something interesting about those people, you start asking them questions, right? So functional aspects of flow cytometry, I think, are actually very meaningful because it tells us you know, what a cell is doing. Are all the cells in a heterogeneous population doing the same thing? You know, we can define different subsets and look at the differences in, for example, calcium mobilization, increase uh, mitochondrial changes, and so on. I'm not going to go through all of these, as I say, because there are hundreds of them. Um, but those of you who are doing flow cytometry will probably be starting off by looking at cell phenotyping and looking at the expression of markers. And one of the reasons this is very important is because many cell systems are very heterogeneous. The more heterogeneous the cell is, so here we're looking at, uh, on the left, we're looking at um, the, the hemopoietic system. But there are lots of different cell types there. They all express unique markers or unique combinations of markers. So the more things that we can add to our cells, the more specifically we can identify them. This actually plot on the left shows a little bit about sort of data analysis, which I said I'm not going to talk about here, but you know, we're always going to define the cells that we're interested in. We're going to remove things that we're not interested in, which are often clumps of cells and dead cells. And then we can look at our, at our data and look at the expression levels of, um, of cells. And sometimes we see this nice um, bivariate distribution like we are here, nice obvious positive populations, double positive population. Sometimes we see very rare events, 
sometimes we don't see um, obvious populations. We see a sort of smear here. And that's going to be very important when you're doing your analysis. Often we're going to look at our data in context to the biology that we know about our system as well. I said we can look at um, DNA analysis. Um, I'm taking the mammalian cell example here. Um, and we know that you know, cells go through a cell cycle. They, they're quiescent. Then they enter a period of what we call G1 when they're gearing up to divide. They enter the synthetic phase of the cell cycle where they're doubling their genome. So they get to the G2 phase, then mitosis, and then divide. And in simple terms, in terms of the DNA, <clears throat> we know that cells in G1, G0 and G1 have a certain amount of DNA. When they've doubled their genome, which they have twice as much, and when they're synthesizing DNA, they have somewhere in the middle. So we can actually do a very simple experiment to look at the number of cells in each of those phases. Actually here, one sort of, uh, practical implication as well is we're using a linear scale here. Often we, we're using, if we're doing phenotyping, as I showed you in the last slide, we're using a log scale to display our data because there's a big difference in the level of expression. Whereas here, we're just seeing a doubling of fluorescence from cells in G1 to G2. So we use a linear scale. So we can be uh, adaptable in the way we show our data. And one good thing about DNA analysis is we can also do this in the clinic and we can do it retrospectively. So we can take old paraffin embedded material, for example, extract nuclei and look at the DNA content. So this is an example of looking at a colorectal tumor. On the left is a normal area of the biopsy. So we just see cells in, in G1 there. Whereas this is an area of what is um, histologically tumor. And what we see is this aneuploid population here, uh, a population that has a different DNA content. If you overlay them, you can see that difference. And we can derive what we call a DNA index or a diploid index. And what this is saying is this aneuploid population here is about 36% more DNA than the normal diploid population. And sometimes that has prognostic significance, or it may have an influence on the treatment of a particular tumor. We can be more specific about our cell cycle analysis as well by using um, thymidine analogs, some, such as bromodeoxyuridine or BRDU, which allows us to specifically detect cells that are in S phase. Because if we use a thymidine analog, it's only going to go into cells that are actively cycling. So we can separate cells that are in G1, not cycling, cells that are in G2, not cycling, but have twice as much DNA, from our cells that are in S phase, that are BRDU positive, so we know that they're actively cycling. So this gives us more specific information about the number of cells in each phase. And this is actually a very useful technique, particularly if you're in the business of developing um, drugs that might modulate cell proliferation. However, it only looks at cells going through one or two rounds of division. And sometimes we want to look at more rounds of division than that, particularly immunologically. We might stimulate our cells and they might divide multiple times. So how do we do that by flow cytometry? We use a, a dye dilution method. We stain our cells with either a lipid or a protein binding dye. So we have a very strong signal. Then we stimulate them so they proliferate. As that cell divides, it's going to divide that label, that fluorescent label equally between the daughter cells, will now be half as fluorescent. When those cells divide, they'll be half as fluorescent again, and so on. So we can look at multiple rounds of cell division. Controls are very important here because we need to know, you know where our unstimulated and undivided population is, which we can see from that overlay. And you can see that there are what, one, two, three, four rounds of division there. Luckily, these days we have um, software algorithms that help us analyze this data as well. So this is an example from Flojo where we can derive a couple of things. So first of all, the percentage of cells that have divided, because that may be important, but also the number or the average number of times that they've divided. And that may also be important. Um, one of the things that I do in a practical workshop we have is we stimulate T and B cells. And what we see is the T cells divide and proliferate, but the B cells don't. And we can derive these, these numbers. The opposite side of the coin from um, cell proliferation is cell death. 
And one specific form of cell death that we quite often look at is apoptosis. Because if you want to become a successful cancer cell, you want to resist cell death. So apoptosis is something that's quite often studied in the uh, in the cancer research world. And there are a couple of, there are, there are probably 20 or 30 different methods, but a couple of very common ones. One is to look at DNA fragmentation. The cells become apoptotic. They start breaking up their DNA. And we can do that very simply by looking at the DNA content. So I showed you earlier, here's a DNA profile of unstimulated cells. We cause some apoptosis. And what happens is we get this so-called sub-G1 population, which are cells that have lost DNA. So they're now no longer as bright. And we can sort these and we can show that they look morphologically, morphologically apoptotic. Another very common method for looking at apoptosis is to use this protein called a Nexin-5, which binds to phosphatidylserine residues, which are normally inside the plasma membrane, but become externalized as cells progress in apoptosis. So we can separate cells that are live here, cells that have externalized their phosphatidylserine on the surface of the cell, they're apoptotic. And we can separate those from dead cells because a dead cell becomes permeable to DNA binding dyes. We can also, I said flow cytometry is very useful because we can quantitate the signal that we get. And sometimes that's a very important aspect. If you're looking at um, you know, pharmacolog pharmacological assays, you might want to know uh, of the receptors that I have on my cell, how many are occupied. So one thing you might want to know is how many receptors I have on the cell. And we can do this quite simply by flow cytometry, by employing beads. We can buy beads from multiple companies that have known numbers of receptors on their surface. So beads with a high number to beads with a no number. No number. We run those on our flow cytometer by looking at the fluorescence intensity of each of those peaks. We can construct a standard curve. We can then run our sample and we can get an idea of the actual number of receptors. So then if we treat ourselves with something, we can see whether there's a modulation, whether there's an upregulation or a downregulation in the number of receptors. I think the final one I wanted to talk about is just um, cytokine staining. Most of you are aware of, uh, of cytokines, you know, little molecules that uh, send signals out to, to other cells. And often this is measured by uh, ELISAs, something like that, which of course is a cell-free assay. We don't like that sort of thing in flow cytometry. We like to keep things um, cellular. So what we, we do is we don't let the cells release the cytokines. We block the cytokine release. So we can stimulate our cells, block the cytokine release. And there are a couple of different ways of doing that. If we have a heterogeneous population and we're doing an ELISA, we don't know where those cytokines have come from. But if I've got the cells, I can surface stain them. I can phenotype them. If we do that, we then fix and permeabilize our cells because our cytokines are intracellular. We can then do our cytokine staining and we can run them on our flow cytometer. So, so in this particular example, these are the CD4 positive cells. And we can look at the cytokine expression just of that particular population of cells. And obviously, if we had other markers, we could look at the cytokine expression in those as well. It's actually much more specific than an ELISA. We know exactly which phenotypic cell is producing which cytokine. So I'm aware we're coming to the end of our time here. So that was a very quick, really, run through of everything you need to know to design a flow cytometry experiment. And we know that flow cytometry is a very powerful technique, but as always, there are some pitfalls. So the, the earlier you are aware of those, the, uh, the better. Okay? Fewer failed experiments. So we always have to think about the cytometer. That may be the rate limiting step in your experiment. You know, how many lasers, detection channels, et cetera, it has. We need to think about the fluorochromes we're going to use. We need to think about the sample preparation. Now, sometimes that can be quite difficult to do in a, in a, in a web, webinar like this because there are, of course, hundreds of different cell types. And the way you prepare them may be very different for lymphocytes than it is for neurons, for example. And although we haven't covered data analysis, we still need to have to think about that. So hopefully there are some questions that we can answer. This, the slides for this um, webinar will be made available afterwards. I've, I've given them to Antara, so she has those. But if you do want to contact me and say you can follow me on Twitter, you can email me here, or you can follow me on LinkedIn as well. So thank you all very much for your attention. And 
I'll take any questions that we have. Thank you so much, Mr. Davis. Um, we do have a question in the chat asking, how about when analyzing phosphorylated proteins at single cell level using flow cytometry, yeah. specific grading okay. strategy? Yeah. yeah, gating strategy. Yes, so phosphorylation of proteins is something that's become quite important over the past few years. Um, because often just using an antibody against the protein doesn't tell us whether that protein is actually active or doing doing something. What normally happens is that protein is modified in some way, often by phosphorylation. So we can now buy antibodies that are specific for those phosphorylation sites, um, which is great because now we, we, we can tell whether an antibody, whether a protein is, is active or not. However, often the expression level of those proteins is very low. Okay, so experimental design becomes more important in those cases. We want to make sure that one, we're going to use fluorochromes that allow us to detect low level expression. So we need to think about the brightness of our fluorochrome. So often when we're using phosphorylated proteins, we are using something like PE, which is, although we've got a fight to get it into the cell, it is a bright, a bright fluorochrome. Um, and we also have to think about what effect any fixation and permeabilization may have on both our proteins and potentially our fluorochromes as well. Um, so it, it is something that's done out there. Um, it, it just takes, you probably have to think a little bit more about the sample preparation. And in terms of specific gating, that may well depend on the question that you're asking. With phosphorylation, looking at internal phosphorylated proteins, we can do some surface staining in advance of that so we can divide the cells up um, and then we would gate on say, you know, CD4 or CD8 cells and look at the phosphorylation level within each of those. This is the big beauty of flow cytometry. We can do that. Thank you. And um, another question we had on our Excel sheet and um, what's the situation for many of us that we have these flow cytometers in another part of the institution in a core. Mm -hmm. So one of the question was, what do you think are the optimal conditions to transport these samples to when the uh, machine is not located in their building? Okay, right. That's, that's a very important question because often in res resource poor areas, it is the fact that, you know, you're not near the, the cytometer you want to, to run them on. So then I suppose it is always going to depend on the specific question that you're asking, because sometimes it's possible to stain your samples at a particular location and fix them generally in formaldehyde, which means that they're then stable um, at four degrees to enable to be, to be transported. There are some um, commercial solutions that stabilize, particularly peripheral blood. Those, so there's something called transfix, which comes from Caltech. Caltag, sorry, um, which allows again transport of samples between um, between locations, but often it may depend on the question that you're asking. Obviously, in an ideal world, you want to do your staining and run your samples as quickly as possible. Okay. So you may have to do a few experiments to work out what, what's the best. Perfect, thank you. Um, the next question we have in the chat is. How can I identify that the cytometer is dirty? Good question. Good question. Because most cytometers are run, uh, well, lots of people will use a flow cytometer. So we will always insist that people run a cleaning procedure at the end of their run, which is generally a combination of a detergent, which will get rid of any organic matter, and a bleach, will, which will get rid of any fluorochromes that happen to be in the, in the system, and then flush that through with water. Um, and sometimes that's also what you might do when you come to the cytometer as well. That would help um, clean everything. Because a, a dirty cytometer is um, not going to give you optimal results. So cleaning procedures are important. Well, the way you'd identify that is I would normally run a tube of filtered PBS and see if I see any signals on the forward and side scatter plot. If I if I see a lot, then I would run a cleaning procedure. If I see one or two, I'm, you are going to always get a background. We have another one. How often or when it is recommended to have a positive control as um, 
immunocontrol or cytotrol cells. Okay. Um, again, again, all of these, my answer to everything is always, it depends. Right? It, it really will depend on the, the question um, that you're asking. Uh, I often will have a positive control if I'm doing a functional assay. If I'm looking for um, cell death, for example, I will have a control where I've induced cell death so that I know that my reagents are working and I can pick up that particular um, population. Immunotrol and cytotrol cells are quite useful if you are doing immunophenotyping on peripheral blood because they are either um, stabilized whole blood or um, lyophilized lymphocytes. So they do give you a biological control. So if, if you wanted to, to make sure that your antibodies are actually binding to a real biological control, you know, if you see something that's negative in your sample, you want to know whether it's just because the antibody is not binding or whether really you don't have anything there, then, um, then I would run a positive control as well. And there's a follow-up question there, there about um, how often, oh no, sorry, that's the same question. Yes, that's the same question. Um, <laughs> a question I had was like, what is the difference and what's more important between compensation and FMOs? Like, do you always need to have these two? You, if you're doing a multicolor experiment, I would always have compensation controls and yes. I would always prepare them and run them fresh each time as well. Okay. Because then that controls for any issues with the, the, the cytometer and your staining. So it, compensation controls are there to allow us to see the overlap, the spillover between the fluorochromes, and we can then compensate that. The FMOs is a slightly different concept. It's almost the opposite of the single color control. The FMO is a tube that contains all the fluorochromes except the one that you're interested in, because that then allows us to assess the contribution to that channel from other fluorochromes in the system. Now, whether you want to use an FMO, again, depends on the, the biology. If I've got an obvious positive and negative, I probably don't need an FMO. I know it's easy to see where they are. But if I've got a sort of continuous expression, then I want to know that where I can have a cutoff of what is positive. And that's where the FMO will be important. So in a multicolor experiment, we probably wouldn't have to do an FMO for every marker, just the ones that had that you know, gradation of expression. Thank you. Uh, we have another question um, from Temi Tayo. He says, thank you for this webinar. It's one of the most detailed and impactful ones I've ever attended. And how does the spectral flow cytometer differ from the regular ones in their mechanism? Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's an excellent question. It's one that you know we now have to start thinking about when we're teaching cytometry because spectral flow cytometers are becoming more and more common. And I suspect within the next few years, all flow cytometers will be well, all flow cytometers are spectral now, but uh, what we mean by spectral cytometry is that we're actually looking at the full spectrum, not just parts of it by using bandpass filters. So the two main differences are that we are going to you know, look at the whole spectrum for each fluorochrome from every laser on our flow cytometer. So normally if we're using FITC, we think, well, that's excited by a blue laser, we detect it at 530. But with spectral flow cytometer, we use that blue laser, but we look at the whole expression, uh, emission, not just from the blue laser, we do it from the red laser and the other lasers as well. So we get a lot more information. So rather than having you know, 10 or 20 detection channels, there are some spectral machines that have 170 or something detection channels. Doesn't mean to say you can do 170 fluorochromes though. The other major difference between the spectral machines and conventional flow cytometers is that we don't compensate. We use a process called spectral unmixing to account for the, for the spillover. And the end result is very similar. I mean, we want to make sure that what we detect in a particular area of the space is just from one fluorochrome. It's just a, a more complex way of doing that. We could have another whole webinar on spectral analysis as well. Thank you. And I think just to um, start wrapping up, uh, one of the main questions was um, a lot of us feel very overwhelmed with all the possibilities that uh, flow cyt cytometry offers. What would you 
um, recommend or advice to researchers like us that are starting or trying to figure out how to make the most out of flow cytometry? I, I think most people's journeys in flow cytometry starts with, you know, starts with a single step, doesn't it? You're going to have an experiment that you think flow cytometry is the answer to. So understanding what we've talked about here, the fluorochromes and the cytometer and your biological situation is the first starting point. I think once you've started that, once you've understand how the flow cytometer works, then you can start thinking about what else can I do here? How, can I make my experiments more complex? Can I add in other things? I may just be phenotyping. Do I want to put functional assays in there as well? Um, so it, it is an iterative process. I do get a little bit concerned when people come and say, right, I want to start doing a 40 color experiment okay? because it's not going to work. Start off simple and understand the principles of how the cytometry works and then gradually ramp things up. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Priscilla. There's another question which has directly got sent to me, so I'm just reading it out. What utilities are needed for cell flow cytometry meter and what would be the consumables for uh, or a budget? And uh, the sender also wanted to know about the usability of uh, flow cytometry in vaccines quality control. You can elaborate on that. Okay, uh, there's quite a lot in there, isn't there? Um, obviously, a flow cytometer is a is a machine that needs some tender loving care. Uh, there are some consumable costs. The, the sheath fluid costs money. You see, the machines themselves cost money. It's always, if you can afford it, worth having a machine on a service contract because they do break down from time to time. The lasers have a finite life as well, which are generally covered by service contracts. Um, it depends on where you're working. So in the core facilities that I've run in the past, most of the consumable costs for the experiments are borne by the end user. So they, they buy their own antibodies and reagents and, and so on. Um, does that answer the first part of the question? I think yes. the second part was about use in vaccine. Uh, Excellent. Research. So flow cytometers are quite often used in um, in the, the regulated environments as well. Uh, so things are a little bit more stringent there. You obviously have to have protocols in place to know, um, you know quite stringent SOPs for machine preparation and running the samples as, as well. Um, and this this is the case for the production of antibodies, uh, production of viruses or quality control of um, things like that as well. Um, so it is possible. It just gets more complex and there's more paperwork involved. In the research so world, I, we're much freer, right? So I had one question. Uh, if we're working with patient samples and there's a limitation on the amount of sample that we can actually mm -hmm. procure, and there is a difference of the number of events between the unstained control and the uh, the, the sample that we are processing what would be a, a minimum number of events or cells or whatever parameter we are counting or the data to be significant or to be, uh, okay uh, yeah that's, that's another that's another good question um, so normally we don't think about the total number of cells what we think about is the smallest population that you're going to be analyzing um, and to be statistically robust you need about 500 cells of interest Okay, so you work backwards, you know, if you've got 1% and you need to get 500, then you've got to measure 5,000 cells, 50,000 cells. Okay. But you're right, sometimes you are sample limited and that, that can be a problem because although your single color controls can be beads, if you have any FMOs, they need to be cells. So you have to factor that into how many cells you have in your samples. Yes, we have reached the end of the webinar and there are a lot of thank you uh, messages on the chat. So it's really... Thank you, everybody. And if you do think of any other questions, you know, you have my contact details and please feel free to email me. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending the webinar. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Sir Davis, for giving your precious time for this uh, webinar series. My pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for coming.